All right, so I'm um, dipping my toe a bit in more of the esoteric side of things here. I'm going to be reading a section uh, from Rudolf Steiner's The Archangel Michael, His Mission and Ours. Uh, it's a book, uh, it's a, si a series of lectures and writings from Rudolf Steiner, I believe in the early 20th century. Um, and I wanted to read this section. I found it interesting and fascinating. And, you know, there's a lot of ideas that pop up in this book that may seem luciferic and may be as well. Uh, but I find that, you know, for myself, if I'm rooted, you know, appropriately in my, you know, kind of my orthodox uh, faith, uh, I can explore the fringes in, in these other territories um, and maybe have some fruitful dialogue with them, you know, all with, with humility, of course, and hopefully without getting kind of sucked in. But I don't think that's necessarily the case with Rudolf Steiner here. Uh, he's obviously an esotericist. He wrote a book called Esoteric Science. Um, uh, he wrote a lot on human freedom. He writes a lot on consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. He's got some really interesting and novel ideas. He was writing kind of towards the tail end of the German idealism age. Uh, and I think he's he's got interesting concepts and ideas. And I think he's going to have more attention on him here in, in the future. But in this section... I'm going to read from um, Michael's Mission, the chapters entitled uh, Michael's Mission, the Spiritualization of the Knowledge of Space, which he wrote in 1922. The second, second section in this uh, chapter I'm going to read from is entitled Michael, the Dragon and the Human Soul, or Gimut. He wrote this in Vienna, September 27th, 1923. And guys, let me know if what you think of Rudolf Steiner, if you're familiar with him. Um, you know, just wanted to switch it up a little bit here and give you guys a little bit, uh, a little flavor of um, the Archangel Michael, his mission and ours, according to Rudolf Steiner. Here we go. When anthroposophy is discussed in certain circles today, one of the main misstatements made about it is it's intellectual, that it appeal, appeals predominantly to the scientific mind, that it does not sufficiently consider the needs of the human gemut or soul. So Gemut, he translates here, it's a German word, G-E-M-U-T. He has here, the German word Gemut is almost untranslatable. Rudolf Steiner says of it, this Gemut lives in the center of the soul life. The dictionary defines Gemut as heart, soul, or mind. But these must be thought of as one, not as separate. Hence, the original translator proposes, quote, the mind warmed by a loving heart and stimulated by the soul's imaginative power. Uh, I think the Greek term nous, uh, would be semi-appropriate here, maybe the lower noose, and uh, you'll see kind of as we read through this, if that makes sense. So today, in what I might call a sort of historical retrospect, we shall discuss first how in earlier periods of human evolution, this gemut was granted a voice in the search for knowledge. It was permitted to conjure up grandiose and mighty images before the human soul intended to illuminate the efforts of human beings to realize their incorporation into the body of world events and the cosmos, as well as their participation in the changing times. In those days when the human gemult was still allowed to contribute its share to the creation of worldviews, these images it conjured up really constituted their most important element. They represented vast and comprehensive cosmic relationships and assigned humanity its place in them. To create a basis for further study of the human gemut from the perspective of anthroposophy, I should like to present to you today with one of those grandiose majestic images that used to function in the way I have indicated. At the time, this image is one of those that is especially appropriate to bring before our souls in a new manner. With this appropriateness, we shall also deal. I should like to talk to you then about an image which, with which you are all familiar, but whose significance of, for human consciousness has gradually or partly faded and partly suffered from misconception. I refer to the image of Michael's conflict or battle with the dragon. Many people are still deeply affected by this image, but its more profound content is either only faintly understood or misunderstood. At best, the image makes no close contact with the human gemut. As it, as it did once, even as late as the 18th century. People today have no understanding of the changes that have taken place in this respect of how a great proportion of what so-called intelligent people today call fantastic visions constituted the most serious element of ancient worldviews. This is the case, above all, with the image of Michael's combat with the dragon. 
Nowadays, most people, when they reflect on human evolution on the Earth, are inclined by a materialistic worldview to trace the rela relatively more perfect human form further and further back to less perfect forms to physical animal forebears. In this way, they actually move away from contemporary human beings who can experience their own natures in an inner psycho-spiritual way to arrive at far more material creatures from whom human beings are supposed to have descended, creatures standing much closer to material existence. In other words, people assume that matter has gradually evolved upward to the point where it experiences spirit. But that was not the view even in comparatively recent times. In fact, it was really the exact opposite. Even as late in the eight, as the 18th century, when those who had not been infected by the materialistic mentality and perspective cast their inner gaze back to prehistoric humankind, they saw their ancestors not as beings who were less human than themselves, but as beings who were more spiritual. In fact, most people at that time were not yet materialistic. Looking back, they saw beings in whom spirituality was so inherent that they did not take on physical bodies as people on earth do today. Indeed, for them, the earth was, as we know it, did not even exist for them. That is, looking back to their forebearers, people in the 18th century still beheld beings who lived in a higher, more spiritual way than human beings of their time. These beings had bodies of much finer, more spiritual substance than we know today. They did not assign beings who were like present-day humans to such a sphere, but more exalted beings, beings having at most an etheric body, but not a physical one. Such approximately, such approximately were our ancestors as people in the 18th century still conceived. People used to look back to a time when there were no so-called higher animals either, when at most there existed only animals whose descendants of the jellyfish kind live in the oceans today. On what was the ancestor of our earth, therefore they imagined, so to speak, an animal kingdom on the plane below that of the human beings, and above this a kingdom embracing only beings with, at most, an etheric body. In other words, what I enumerated in occult science and outline as beings of higher hierarchies would still be today, though in a different form, what was then considered in a certain sense the ancestry of humanity. These beings, Angeloi, Archangeli, and Archai, were not destined in their then a stage of evolution to be free beings in the sense in which we speak of freedom in relation to human beings. These beings did not experience the will in a way that could give them the unique feeling we humans express when we speak of, quote, desiring something arbitrarily. These beings desired nothing arbitrarily. They willed what flowed into their being as divine will, for they had completely identified their will with the divine will. The divine beings ranked, ranking above them and signifying in their interrelationships the divine guidance of the world, these beings willed, in a sense, through the lower spirits, the archangels and angels, so that the latter willed absolutely according to the purpose and in the sense of superior divine spiritual will. The world of ideas of this older humanity was as follows. It was believed that in the ancient epoch, the time had not yet come when beings could develop who would be conscious of the feeling of freedom. The divine spiritual world order had postponed to a later epoch the moment when a number of the spirits identified with the divine will were to receive the free will of their own. This would occur when the right moment in world evolution was reached. But then, as this ancient humanity saw it, a certain number of beings arose among these spirits who wanted to disassociate their will, as it were, emancipate it from the divine will although their true cosmic destiny was to remain identified with the will of the divine spirit. In superhuman pride, certain beings revolted because they desired freedom of will before the time had come for their freedom to mature. And the most important of these beings, their leader, was conceived of as a being who took the shape in the dragon that Michael combats. Michael, who remained above in the realm of those spirits that wanted to continue molding their will to the divine spiritual will above them. By thus remaining steadfast within the divine spiritual will, Michael received the impulse to deal adequately with the spirit that grasped at freedom prematurely, if I may put it in that way, for the forms possessed by beings of the hierarchy of the Angeli, Archangeli, and Archai were simply not adapted to beings destined to have free will, that is, emancipated from divine will, as I have described.
Such forms, namely the human form, were not to come into being until later in world evolution. All this is conceived as happening in a period when cosmic development of the human form was not yet possible, nor were higher animal forms possible, only the low ones I mentioned. Thus, a form had to come into being that might be called cosmically contradictory, and the refractory spirit had to be poured into this mold, so to speak. It could neither be an animal form of the kind destined to appear only later, nor an animal form of that time made of then prevalent softer matter, so to speak. It could only be an animal form that differed from any that was possible in the physical world. At the time, in order to represent a cosmic contradiction, it had to resemble an animal. And the only form that could be evol evolved out of what was possible at that time was the form of a dragon. Naturally, when painted or otherwise represented, this dragon has been interpreted in various ways throughout history, more or less suitably interpreted according to what artists were able to cognize with inner imagination of a being that had developed the refractory will. In any case, this form is not to be found among those that became possible in the physical world in the animal range up to the human. It had to remain a supersensible being. As such, it could not exist in the realm inhabited by beings of the higher hierarchies, angels, archangels, and so forth. It had to be transferred, as it were, and placed among the beings that could evolve in the course of physical de development. This is the story of, quote, the fall of the dragon from heaven to earth. It was Michael's deed to bestow this form that is supra-animalistic, i.e. supersensible, but intolerable in the supersensible realm. For although the dragon is supersensible, it is incompatible with the realm of the supersensible where it existed before it rebelled. Thus, this dragon form was transferred to the physical world, but as a superphysical, supersensible form. It lived thereafter in the realm where the minerals, plants, and animals live, in what became the earth. But it did not live there in a way that a human eye could perceive it as it does an ordinary animal. When the soul's eye is raised to those worlds for which provision was made, so to speak, in the plan of higher worlds, it beholds in its imaginations the beings of the higher hierarchies. And when the human physical eye observes the physical world, it sees simply what has come into being in the various kingdoms of nature, up to the form of the physical sensible human being. But when the soul's eye is directed to what physical nature embraces, it beholds this inherently contradictory form of the adversary, of the one who is like an animal, and yet not like an animal, the one who dwells in the visible world, yet is himself invisible. It beholds the form of the dragon. And in the whole genesis of the dragon, human beings of old saw the act of Michael, who remained in the realm of spirit, in the form appropriate to that realm. The earth then came into being, and with it humanity, and human beings were meant to become, in a sense, twofold beings. With one part of their being, with their psycho-spiritual part, they were to reach up into what is called the heavenly or supersensible world, and with the other, with their physical etheric part, they were to belong to the nature which came into being as the nature of the earth, a new cosmic body, the cosmic body to which the apostate spirit, the adversary, was relegated. This is where human beings had to come into being. They were the beings who, according to the primordial decree that underlies all, belonged in this world. Humanity belongs on the earth. The dragon did not belong on the earth, but he had been transferred there. And now consider what humans encountered on the earth as they came into existence with it. They encountered what had evolved as outer nature from the previous kingdom of nature, which tended toward and culminated in our present mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms up to our own physical form. This is what humanity encountered, what we are accustomed to call extra human nature. But what was this? It was and still is today the continuation of what was intended by the highest creative powers in the ongoing plan for the world's evolution. That is, that is why as human beings experiencing in our gamut or soul, we can look out upon external nature, upon the minerals, and all this connected with the mineral world, upon the wondrous crystal formations, upon the mountains, the clouds, and all the other forms, and behold this outer nature in its condition of death, as it were, its condition of not being alive. 
but we see all this that is not alive as something that an earlier divine world discarded, just as the human corpse, though with a different significance, is discarded by the living person at death. Although the visible aspect of the human corpse is not something that can impress us positively at first sight, yet in a certain sense it is a divine corpse, a corpse on a higher plane that arose in the mineral kingdom and may be regarded as reflecting in its form and shape the originally formless living divinity. Indeed, what then comes into being as the higher kingdoms of nature can be regarded as further reflections of what originally existed as the formless divine. In other words, someone can gaze upon the whole of nature and feel that this extra human nature is a mirror of the divine in this world. And that, after all, is what nature is supposed to give to our human gemut, a mirror of the divine. Naively, and not by means of speculation, we must be able to feel joy and harmony at the sight of this or that manifestation of nature. We must be able to feel inner jubilation and enthusiasm when we experience creative nature in its sprouting and blossoming. And our very unawareness of the cause of this elation, this enthusiasm, this overflowing joy in nature, should evoke deep down in our hearts the feeling that our gamut is so intimately related to nature that we can recognize dimly, quote, all this nature the gods have taken out of themselves and established in the world as their mirror, the same gods from whom my gamut derives, from whom I myself spring, but in a different way, close quote. All our inner relation and joy in nature, all that rises within us as a feeling of release when we participate vividly in the freshness of nature, all this should be attuned to the feeling of relationship between our human gamut and what, lie, what, what lives out there in nature as a mirror of the divinity. Such was the feeling still cherished by many enlightened people even in the 18th century. They still felt vividly the difference between our outer nature and what nature became, becomes after humans have devoured, breathed, and perceived it. They felt the difference between naive outer nature as it is perceptible to the senses and human inwardly surging sensuality. This difference was still lovingly clear to many in the 18th century who experienced nature and humanity and described them to their pupils, described how nature and humanity are involved in the conflict between Michael and the dragon. Considering that this radical polaric contrast of outer nature and its essential innocence and inner human nature and its corruption or guilt still occupied human souls in the 18th century, we must not forget the dragon that Michael relegated to the world of nature because he found it unworthy to remain in the world of spirituality. Out in the world of minerals, plants, even of animals, the dragon whose form is incompatible with nature assumed none of the forms of nature beings. It's an interesting section here, I underlined. It assumed the dragon form, which today must seem fantastic to many of us, a form that must inevitably remain supersensible. It cannot enter a mineral, a plant, or an animal, nor can it enter a physical human body. But it can enter that which outer, but it can enter that which outer innocent nature becomes in the form of guilt, in the upwelling life of instincts, in the physical human body. Reminds me of the passions, right? Thus, as late as the 18th century, many people still said, quote, and the dragon, the old serpent, was cast down out of heaven to earth where it had been, where it had no home. But then it built its bulwark in human nature, and now it is entrenched there, close quote. In this way, the mighty image of Michael and the dragon was still an integral part of human cognition in those times. And anthroposophy appropriate to that period would have explained that by taking outer nature into oneself through nourishment, breathing, and perception, one creates within oneself a sphere of action for the dragon. The dragon lives in human nature. This idea lived clearly in the souls of people in the 18th century. Indeed, one can easily imagine that if they ask some clairvoyant being on another planet to draw a picture of the earth, this clairvoyant would have shown everything existing in the mineral, plant, and animal realms in a word, in the extra human realm as bearing no trace of the dragon and to represent the earth being the clairvoyant would have drawn the dragon coiling through anima through the animality in human beings thus the situation had changed relative relative to what it had been in pre-human times 
For pre-humanity, the conflict between Michael and the dragon was located in outer objectivity, so to speak. But now the dragon was outwardly nowhere to be found. Where then was it? Where would one have to look for it? Anywhere there were human beings on earth, that's where the dragon was. If Michael wanted to carry on his mission, which in pre-human times lay in objective nature, when his task was to conquer the dragon, the world monster, externally, then he had to continue the struggle within human nature. This change from outward to inward occurred in the remote past and persisted into the 18th century. Those who held this view knew that they had transferred to the inner human being an event that formerly had been a cosmic one. In effect, they said, quote, Looking back at to old times, you must imagine that Michael cast the dragon out of heaven down to earth, an event occurring in extra-human worlds. But now look at it more recent times. Human beings come to earth. They take outer nature into themselves and transform it, and so help the dragon take possession of it. Thus the conflict between Michael and the dragon must now be carried out upon the earth. Close quote. Such trends of thought were not as abstract as people today would like thoughts to be. Today people like to get along with thoughts that are as obvious as possible. They put it in this way, quote, Well, formerly an event like the conflict between Michael and the dragon was simply thought as, of as external, but in the course of evolution of humanity has turned inward. Hence, such an event is now perceived only inwardly, close quote. Truly, those who are content to stop at such abstractions are not to be envied, and in any case, they fail to envision the course of the world history of human thought. For it happened, as I have just presented it, the outer cosmic conflict of Michael and the dragon was transferred to the inner human being, because only in human nature could the dragon now find its sphere of action. This moving of the dragon into the human being brought the germination of human freedom into Michael's task. For if the conflict had simply continued within the human beings in the same way that it had formerly taken place outside of them, the human beings would have become complete automatons. That's striking. By being transferred into the human interior, the struggle becomes, in a sense, to express it in an outer abstraction, a battle between higher and lower human natures. Now, the only form higher nature could assume for human consciousness was that of Michael in the supersensible worlds, to whom human beings were led to lift their gaze. As a matter of fact, in the 18th century, numerous guides and instruction, instructions still existed, all providing ways by which people could reach the sphere of Michael and, with the help of Michael's power, fight the dragon dwelling in their animal natures. A person able to see into the deeper spiritual life of the 18th century would have to be pictured somewhat as follows. Outwardly, there is the human form, in whose lower animalistic portion the dragon is writhing, even coiling, about the heart. And then, as it were, behind the person, for higher things are seen with the back of the head, there is the outer cosmic figure of Michael, towering, radiant, both retaining this cosmic nature and reflecting it it's a higher human nature, so that the person's etheric body etherically reflects Michael's cosmic figure. And then, in the head, but working down into the heart, one can see Michael's power or force crushing the dragon and causing its blood to flow from the heart down to the limbs. Such was the picture of inner human struggle between Michael and the dragon that many people still harbored in the 18th century. It was also the picture that suggested to many people that, as they put it, it was their duty to conquer the lower with the help of the higher. In other words, it was a picture that taught people that they needed the power of Michael for their own lives. Scientific intellect, on the other hand, sees the Kant Laplace, the theory of the origin of the universe. It sees the Kant Laplace primal vapor, perhaps even a spiritual vapor or spiral vapor. And out of this, the planets evolve, leaving the sun in the middle. And then... On one of these planets, the kingdoms of nature gradually arise. Humanity comes into being. And looking f into the future, intellect sees all this passing over again into the great graveyard of natural existence. The intellect cannot help Im imagining the matter in this way. And because intellect has increasingly become the sole recognized authority on human cognition, philosophy has gradually become what it is today for humankind in general. But in all the earlier peoples of whom I have spoken, the eye of the soul, as I might call it, was active. 
We can be isolated from the world in our intellects, for everyone has his or her own head, and in that head, his or her own thoughts. But in our gamut, our soul, we cannot become isolated in this way, for the soul is not dependent on the head, but upon the rhythmic organism. This section brought brought up uh, thoughts of Douglas Harding's um, headless headlessness. The air I have within me at the present moment, I did not have within me a moment ago. It was the general air, and in another moment when I exhale it, it will be the general air again. It is only the head that isolates human beings, makes of them hermits on the earth. In fact, even in relation to our soul's physical organization, we are not isolated in this way, but rather belong to the cosmos, indeed are merely figures in the cosmos. But gradually, the gemut, the soul, lost its power of vision and the head alone became seeing. The head by itself, however, develops only intellectually, intellectuality, it isolates people. When human beings still saw their souls, they did not project abstract thoughts onto the cosmos with the object of interpreting or explaining it. They still saw great images into it, like that of Michael's battle with the dragon. Such people saw what lived in their own nature and being, something that had evolved out of this world, the cosmos as I described it today. They saw the inner struggle of Michael come to life in the human being, in the Anthropos. They saw this inner Michael struggle take the place of the outer cosmic Michael struggle. They saw anthrop anthroposophy develop out of cosmo cosmosophy. Whenever we turn from the abstract thoughts that affect us as cold and matter of fact, whose intellectuality makes us shiver and look back to an older worldview, we find ourselves guided to images. One of the greatest of which is Michael's war with the dragon. Michael, who first cast down the dragon to earth where, I may say, the dragon could take up its human fortress. Michael, who then became the fighter of the dragon in humanity, as I have described. In the picture that I have evoked for you today, Michael stands cosmically behind us, while within us is an etheric image of Michael. This image carries out the real struggle by which human beings themselves, participating in Michael's battle, can gradually become free. For it is not Michael himself who wages the battle, but human devotion and the image of Michael that it calls forth. In the cosmic, in the cosmic Michael, there still lives that being who engaged in the original cosmic struggle with the dragon. We can look toward this being. Truly not upon earth alone do events take place. In fact, earthly events remain incomprehensible to us unless we can see them as images of events in the supersensible world and to find their causes there. In this regard, a deed was performed by Michael in the supersensible realm shortly before our time, a deed I should like to characterize in the following way. In doing so, I must speak in a way that is discredited today as being anthropomorphic. And yet, how could I relate what occurs in the supersensible world other than by using human words to describe it? The epoch during which Michael cast the dragon down to earth may be thought of as lying far back in pre-human times. But then when humanity appears upon the earth, the war between Michael and the dragon becomes even more an inner struggle. Until at the end of the 19th century, Michael could say, quote, my image in humanity is now sufficiently condensed for human beings to be aware of it within themselves. They can now feel the conqueror of the dragon in their souls, or at least the image means something to them, close quote. The last third of the 19th century stands for something extraordinarily important in human evolution. In ancient times, only a tenuous image of Michael existed in human beings, but this image condensed more and more, and in the last third of the 19th century, the situation changed. In earlier times, the invisible, supersensible dragon was predominantly active in the passions and instincts, desires and animal lusts. For ordinary consciousness, this dragon remains subsensible. It lives in humanity's animal nature. It lives in all that tends to drag human beings down and all that incites human beings to become more and more subhuman. This condition was such that Michael always intervened in human nature in order that humanity should not fall too low. In the last third of the 18th century, however, Michael's image in human beings became so strong that now it depended, as it were, upon people's goodwill to consciously feel themselves upward and raise themselves to Michael's image. In order that 
on the one hand, they might see the image of the dragon in their unenlightened experience of the feelings, while on the other, the radiant figure of Michael may stand before their soul's eye, radiant in spiritual vision, yet within the reach of ordinary consciousness. Thus, the content of the human soul can be this, quote, The power of the dragon is working within me, trying to drag me down. I do not see it. I feel it as something that would drag me down below myself. But in the spirit, I see a luminous angel whose cosmic task has always been the vanquishing of the dragon. I concentrate my soul upon this glowing figure. I let it light stream into my gamut, and thus my soul, illumined and warmed, will bear within it the strength of Michael. Hence, out of my many, my own free resolution, I shall be able, through my alliance with Michael, to conquer the might of the dragon in my lower nature. Close quote. If the good will necessary, if the good will necessary to rise, erase such a conception to a religious force and to inscribe it in every human soul were widely available, then we would not have all the, we would not have all the vague and imp impotent ideas such as prevail in every quarter today. Plans, to, plans for reforms and the like. Rather, we would have something that could once more seize hold of the whole inner being be, because something that can seize the inner being can be inscribed in the living soul, which enters into a living relationship with the whole cosmos the moment it really comes to life. Then those glowing thoughts of Michael would be the first harbingers of our ability to penetrate once more into the supersensible world. The striving for enlightenment would become inwardly and deeply religious, and thereby human beings would be prepared to celebrate the festivals of the year, whose understanding only glimmers faintly across the ages, but at least it glimmers. They would be prepared to celebrate in full consciousness the festival of the calendar sets at the end of September, at the beginning of autumn, the Michael festival, Michaelmas. For Michaelmas will regain its significance only when we are able to experience in our souls such a living vision. When we can feel this vision in a living way and can make it into an instinctive contemporary social impulse, then this Michael festival, because the impulses spring directly from the spiritual world, could well be regarded as the crowning impulse of our time. Indeed, even in the initial impulse, we would need to find our way out of the present disaster. For it would add something real to all the talk about ideals, something not originating in human heads or hearts but in the cosmos. And then when trees shed their leaves and blossoms ripen into fruit and nature sends us her first frost and prepares to sink into her winter death, we would be able to feel the burgeoning of spirit with each with which we should unite ourselves to Michaelmas, just as we feel the Easter festival in sprouting, budding spring. Then, as citizens of the cosmos, we would be able to carry impulses into our lives which, because they are not abstract, would not remain ineffective, but would reveal their power immediately. Indeed, until now, until we can develop such cosmic impulses in our soul, life will not have a soul content again. That is the end of that section. Uh, if you're not familiar with Steiner, his uh, writings on Christ are very uh, interesting and thought-provoking couches it in terms of uh of this, uh, this evolutionary spiritual evolutionary framework but he has a uh, high reverence for uh, christ and he's got a lot of writings uh about the christ event that he calls it he sees it as a cosmic event that happens in the entire cosmos um uh, that's all i can really say about that right now but let me know if you guys are still with me here uh, appreciate it let me know what you think and i'll see you guys um next video